about civil law and how you had to have standing to sue, correct? Yeah, and that you could sue for just about anything, all right? But you have to demonstrate you've been damaged. Like Nike, if they want to continue this lawsuit in court, they will have to demonstrate that their brand or their profit margins have been affected by this. So what they would do is they would probably get a bunch of negative tweets or posts that people put out there on social media or phone messages recorded and say, look, this damaged us because people think we're the ones selling them. All right, so they would have to demonstrate that. Now, sometimes lawsuits happen for an entire group of people affected by something. Sometimes it's not just one person damaged. You ever seen those commercials that say, are you or a loved one suffering from mesothelioma caused by a work-related environment? That's because that law firm is filing a lawsuit on behalf of an entire group of people, anybody affected by that particular uh, medical condition. Right? That's what we call a class action lawsuit, when an entire group of people are being represented for a lawsuit. Here's another example. Uh, back in the 90s, there was a weight loss drug called FinFen. Not making up that name either. Uh, and it was really good. It was a weight loss drug that, uh, that worked. A lot of people were taking it, but they found out later on it caused heart problems. All right. And ultimately, the, the heart problems associated with, they're like, hey, if, if you've taken this drug, we're filing, this law firm was filing a class action lawsuit saying, we're going to sue the manufacturer of this drug, right? And uh, my mom had taken that drug, and like when they settled, there were so many people that had taken the drug and that were affected by it that they took the money they got from the settlement and they split it up. And my mom got $50. So, you know, that uh, seems pretty bizarre. But uh, here's another example. The state of West Virginia, who did they sue recently? Anybody know? For hurting West Virginians. What has hurt West Virginians more than anything in the last 10 years? Drugs. What kind of drugs? Opioids. Uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, among other pharmaceutical companies, what did they ship to West Virginia in large quantity? Opioids, painkillers, prescription painkillers. Now, you all don't know this, but back in the 1990s, uh, people, especially when coal mine work was really at its peak in West Virginia, uh, there was a lot of mine, uh, excuse me, a lot of mine activity, and miners oftentimes get injured. And many of them needed a, a legitimate painkiller, right? And these people marketed opioids, uh, things like Oxycontin, as a drug that you could use that would effectively kill the pain but it was non-habit forming. It was not addictive, right? And we see how that turned out. And the problem was what would happen, good natured people would take this drug thinking that it was gonna hurt, it was gonna help their pain, and at the same time it wasn't habit forming, and we realized that's not true. When they couldn't get Oxycontin anymore or any prescription drugs, where did they turn? Heroin, which is a cheap substitute for uh, Oxycontin. In West Virginia, has been working to get some of these uh, pharmaceutical companies on the hook for this. And uh, in particular, I don't know if you saw this, but a few years ago, uh, the Charleston Gazette, their, one of their reporters won a Pulitzer Prize for reporting, like uncovering some of this, because uh, one company had sent more than 6 million pills to Kermit, West Virginia, who has like a population of like five or 600 people. And they sent 6 million pills in like two years. And they're like, didn't you, the pharmaceutical company, get suspicious when all these pills kept getting shipped to this small town? And they're like, no, it's just pharmacists making orders. And they're like, you didn't think that was a lot of pills for one town? Uh, and the state of West Virginia got hit by this in general. And we're talking like, I think at one point, there was uh, enough pills for every man, woman, and child in West Virginia to have like, you know, five pain pills per year, you know? And I'm like, that's a lot of pain pills. So, I was just outrageous. So that's how you handle situations like this, that if it can't be settled by criminal law, you can file a lawsuit. And sometimes you can do it on behalf of an entire group of people. Okay? Now, when you file these cases, all right, there are different levels of federal court. And if you're going to file a lawsuit or if you are being accused of a crime, your case will almost definitely start at a federal district court. OK. Sure, your case is going to originate at what we call a federal district court. It's the bottom level of the federal court system. There are 94 unique 
districts in the country. Okay? The nation's broken up into 94 specific districts. I'll show you how in just a second. No, you don't need to know that there's one in Guam. The graphic just included it, so I thought I would include it. Okay? There's 94 unique districts, and let me show you a map. This will help. Ignore the color part of it. Uh, hit the lights for a second, Armstrong, so you can see it's a little bit better. See how it's like some states are divided up into little jagged lines here, like a jigsaw puzzle. And West Virginia has two districts. We have the Northern Federal District and the Southern Federal District of West Virginia. So if you commit a crime here in Southern West Virginia, that's where your trial is going to take place. We have federal courthouses down in Huntington, Charleston, Bluefield, and Beckley here in the Southern District. Okay. I think in the Northern District, you got like Fairmont, Morgantown, Martinsburg. There are federal courthouses there. If, uh, anything that you violated a federal crime for. Okay. That would definitely be an example. Now, some states, and you'll see more states have uh, more federal districts depending on the amount of activity that takes place. Like Montana by itself is just one federal district. Because how many people live out there? Not many. So there's not a lot of crime out there as compared uh, in terms of sheer numbers. So they don't have that many districts. They don't need them, right? Virginia, North Carolina. I don't know why South Carolina is only one district. Maybe they don't get a lot of federal charges there. But you can see Texas, multiple districts. There's 94 of these districts nationwide, though. Okay? Now, in every single one of these districts, there is a person called a U.S. district attorney. And they represent the government in cases. So if it's, you know, let's say that Charlie here is on trial for, what do you want to be on trial for, Charlie? Bank robbery. Bank robbery it is. United States versus Charlie Chafin for the crimes of bank robbery. And let's say she's going to be charged here in the Southern District in West Virginia. Uh, there is a district attorney who represents the government, and it's their job to prosecute you, to try to put you in jail. And they have several assistant district attorneys who help them out. Okay, so if I'm the DA, the district attorney for Southern West Virginia, I got several people working with me, and our job is to put away bad guys in this district. There's a district attorney down here, this district in Texas. There's one down here in Florida in that district. Okay, 94 districts. Guess how many district attorneys there are? Oh my gosh, you guys are geniuses. Okay, hit the lights back on there. Okay, so you got these districts, these 94 districts, and in every district, trying the cases, there's a certain number of judges who work in the district too, right? And the number of judges depends on how much activity there is there. Okay, I think at the Huntington Courthouse, we got something like six or seven, I want to say six or seven federal judges down there. It varies from one location to the next, depending on how much activity there is. Okay? Now, those federal judges who, like, for example, when Charlie goes on trial, she'll get a jury, and she's going to have her attorney there, and the district attorney would be trying to put her away, and there's a federal judge presiding over the case. Where does that federal judge get his job from? One second. How do federal judges get their job? Nope, not a federal judge. The president. The president appoints these people and the Senate confirms them. So anybody who's at the federal uh, judge at the federal district courthouse in Huntington or at the federal courthouse in Charleston or Bluefield, they got their job from a president appointing them. All right, Charlie, what's your question? Uh, tell me this is going somewhere. Okay, I have not. Charlie, you bring up an, actually a really interesting point. Ted Bundy, or serial killer, is a good example. Because he committed crimes in multiple states, the federal government was like, we're going to try him because he's kind of a big deal, and we want to set an example for what happens to people who do this. So that's why he probably was tried in federal court. I'll look it up to confirm that. Okay? So you would have that here in federal court. Those judges get appointed by the president, and they're there for life. And when you appoint these people... Like, for example, uh, there's one guy I think is getting ready to retire. At least he's getting up there. And uh, 
uh, the president, Joe Biden, is going to be looking like he'll talk to people in and around West Virginia. And his team at the White House will say, hey, who's somebody who'd make a good federal judge? And be like, you know what? I think that we should probably, I don't know, let's bring in Losh over here. She'd be a good federal judge. But when we talk to her, she's got to know that, hey, if we appoint you, we don't expect you to take this job and then leave five years down the road. How long do we want you to hold on to that job? A long time. We're talking decades, okay? Because we don't want to have to fill another opening next year because you decide you want a different job. So if we appoint you, we got to know that you're going to be around for a while, okay? They want people like that because think of it like this. When you appoint federal judges and Supreme Court justices as president, they're going to be around long after you're gone. If you're anti-Donald Trump, Live with this for a moment. He appointed three justices to the Supreme Court. Literally one third of the Supreme Court, one third of the Supreme Court he appointed, meaning his influence will last long after he's gone. Okay? Those federal judges at the district court, they will preside over your trial. We'll talk about what happens after that tomorrow.